The Lewis Speaker Series was endowed with a gift from Tom and Jan Lewis. And the purpose of the series is to provide live presentations by world-class authors, philosophers, and thought leaders in order to prepare the students for the challenges and opportunities of life by covering topics such as self-awareness, personal values, leadership, decision-making, career planning, success, and happiness and also to educate students regarding American values of individual liberty, free enterprise, personal responsibility, faith, family, patriotism, intellectual diversity, community engagement, and civic responsibility. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students, we extend our sincere gratitude to Tom and Jan Lewis for their generosity. I also want to thank everyone who helped promote this event, and especially the University of Kentucky Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise. At any time during this event, you may submit a written comment or question by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Helping me with questions for this event are Dr. Christian Brady, the inaugural Lewis Dean of the Lewis Honors College, and currently serving as the interim dean for the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University of Kentucky. And also Dr. Ryan Boat, who is a faculty member here in the Lewis Honors College. We will address your questions after Dr. McCloskey gives her remarks. And now it's a pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Deidre McCloskey. Dr. McCloskey is a distinguished professor of Economics and of History Emerita and Professor Emerita of English and of Communications at the University of Illinois, Chicago. She also taught for 12 years in economics at the University of Chicago. Trained at Harvard as an economist, she has written over 25 books and edited seven more and has published more than 400 academic articles on economic theory, economic history, philosophy, rhetoric, feminism, ethics, politics, gender studies, and law. Since 2007, she has received six honorary doctorates and in recent years has received prestigious awards for her scholarly activities. You can learn about many of her accomplishments on her website, which we will post in the chat, the link will be in the chat. This evening, Dr. McCloskey will talk, give a talk titled, True Liberalism is Non-Slavery. Dr. McCloskey, welcome. And you wanna, uh, Dr. McCloskey, would you turn your audio on please? There's my audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Good, good. Well, I'm glad to be here. You'll 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 hear me as um, how can I say this? Somewhat distressed because yesterday I had my second shot, and uh, today it's hit me like a ton, ton of bricks. But I I'm. I'm sure we'll we'll have an interesting uh, time here. The the argument I make is very simple, but we need to deal with the word liberalism um, in the United States. That word, for the last hundred years or so, has drifted in the direction not of a free market um, economy and uh, freedom of, 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 of speech and so forth, but it's drifted in the direction of social democracy of say the Swedish sort. And when an American calls someone, whether congratulating them or 
angry at them, a, a liberal, it means to the Americans that she is um, on the left wing of the, of the Democratic uh, uh, Party. But that's not what the word means. Now, of course, you, you choose your words and you pays your uh, uh, price. There's, there's an arbitrary character to any sort of terminology. But liberalism was invented in the 1700s. And at that time, in, in the, in the uh, thinking, for example, of my hero, Adam Smith, when I mention the name of Adam Smith, I always cross, my, 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 cross myself. Um, he, he spoke of liberalism as the, um, the obvious and simple plan of natural liberty. That is to say, against the hierarchies, the hierarchies of um, men over, uh, over uh, 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 women, of masters over slaves, of the state over citizens, as against those hierarchies, which of course had ruled human history since the invention of agriculture, the idea of the 18th century liberals what the, was that these hierarchies, these superiorities of one person over another were to be abandoned. Now, so, so I'm using the word in this classical sense, and I want you all <laughs> to change your vocabulary and start calling people liberals if they believe in non-slavery, non-slavery of one person to another. That's the, the, that's the core idea, an extremely radical idea in 1776, an idea which was only um, partially implemented after all in, in the in the United States, so we, we, we claim to be in, in, in favor of this idea of liberty. We had slaves until 1865. So it, it, it's, it was a slow process of liberation. Uh, first, it was poor men. The age of Andrew G Jackson brought poor men into politics. Then it was the matter of uh, slavery and then the beginnings of uh, freedom or for, for women. And, and then uh, uh, children and gays and, and, and gradual liberation. Now, since the 18th century, since the 1700s, the intellectuals of Europe have had essentially <clears throat> three big ideas about how the society should be organized. The first one, as I say, was this liberalism. And then in the early 1800s, it was nationalism that was uh, um, uh, 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 that became a, a powerful force. And then in, in, in the middle of the 1800s, socialism. Now I would argue that these three ideas were, that, that, that the last two of the three have been terrible, have been a mistake. That, um, well, I always joke that if you like nationalism, and you like socialism, maybe you like German national socialism 
of the 1930s. And the key point here is that both nationalism and socialism subordinate you and me to, to something larger than ourselves, to the, to the, the, to, 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 to the French nation, for example, um, or to the, um, the, the future discerned in socialism. Whereas liberalism, I, uh, I apologize for my stuttering. Like Joe Biden, I've always um, stuttered like Marilyn Monroe, uh, like Winston Churchill, and this sleep that I've had all afternoon is not improving it. But it, 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 another word for liberalism would be adultism. The two other big social and political and economic theories, nationalism and socialism, treat people like children. Now, of course, sometimes you want to be treated like a child. If you're eight years old, uh, you don't want to be thrown by your parents into the, into the marketplace and, 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 and pay your mother for, for, for lunch. But it, it, we should want to be adults. And so there's, there's a profound sense in which liberalism, as I've defined it, and as it's defined outside the United States and Latin America, there's, there's something in the water of the new world that makes people um, uh, appropriate this word um, for uh, nationalist or socialist purposes. There, there, there is a strong sense in which being a free adult, being an adult who takes care of herself, you can think of a hand up when, when a a disaster occurs, or um, ma making sure that uh, Canada doesn't invade the United States, which is something that uh, frightens me every night. I'm terrified. So there are certain collective purposes that even a liberal like me acknowledges as important. But I would argue that under the under the sign of nationalism and socialism, these responsibilities of the state have been grossly increased and in an un, un, unnecessary way, and in a way, and this is crucial, that the, 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 that, 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 that the, 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 the dignity of a free adult is compromised. I mean, in 1900 or so, there was no country in the world which spent through the state, through the, the local government or the national government, more than a total of about 10% of national income of the production of the economy. Now, in most states, something on the order of 30 or 40 percent of what we produce is appropriated for the state by the state for these common these common purposes. Now you can of course take the view that uh, a high share of taxation is 30 or 40% in France, it's over 
50% is necessary for a modern economy. This is a very common argument. I was explaining to my, 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 uh, my cousin Anne what I was um, talking about in a, in, a, in a book that I published a couple of years ago. Why, why liberalism works. And Anne, who's very in, in, in intelligent, said, well, a complicated modern economy needs an activist government. And I replied to her that, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> the more complicated the economy is in modern economies are fantastically specialized and complicated, the less we should try to do top-down um, control of the economy. If, if, if we try it, we're going to make clumsy, clumsy uh, errors. Uh, we're, 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 we're going to be uh, producing too much steel and not enough consumer goods, as in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And we're going to uh, attack the independence of, of, uh, of people. So that's one argument in favor of liberalism. And I want to emphasize that I'm a Christian liberal. What does that mean? I'm an Anglican, I'm an, an Episcopalian, if you call that a Christian. And I believe that you and I have a responsibility to the, the poor of the world and of our communities. So, so it's not, it's not to heck with you. I have my individual uh, maximizing program, and I don't care about these um, these poor people. That's that's not the program. In fact, the great hero of this, John Stuart Mill, the English philosopher of the middle of the nineteenth um, century, was was tending towards a version of socialism in that he too regarded uh, us to have a responsibility to the poor. Um, so it's not sort of to heck with you. It's a, a um, how can I say this, an amiable, um, attitude towards uh, poor people. But the best welfare program for poor people is giving them permission to work. You'd say, well, they've got permission to work. They can go work here and there. But in a modern society tending in this uh, social democratic Erection. There are all kinds of obstacles to your individual choice in occupation, in who you buy things from, in uh, yeah, yeah, about what you buy, and so forth, that are enforced by the state. The spectacular and obvious example is the is is is, is the war on drugs, which has been a um, most unhappy episode, especially for for people of color who, in fact, consume less drugs than the whites, yet bear the burden of incarceration completely disproportionately. So, the the vision here is of a society of free adults, but we have to be careful with the word freedom. There's, I, 
I prefer to use the word liberty, but alas, you notice I stutter on it. <laughs> so I'm more or less stuck with this because liberty has kept its political meaning of not having a master. An English traveler in the West of the United States in the late 19th century asked a free white American who his master was. This is a, a question that in a, tra a tra tra traditionally hierarchical um, society is always answerable. If you're a wife, it's your husband who's your uh, uh, master. If you're a slave, it's your master who's your master. If you're a citizen of a, of a state that's taking 30 or 40 percent of the national income, you're a slave. You're, you have a master on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, because that's, <laughs> that's the share of the seven days of the week that 30 or 40 percent is. So you can congratulate yourself that you have four days out of the seven days that went when you're not a slave. But understand, a slave is a slave is a slave. If you're enslaved Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, if someone is ordering you about making you do things you don't want to do, like pay uh, 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 taxes, um, to the extent of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you're a three a three seventh uh, um, slave. So the, the so, so the as I said the 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 vision here is of a society of equal adults, and and the crucial thing here is freedom uh, is. Liberty, uh, I'll, I'll keep trying to say the word, of permissions, not equality of outcome. There has been a lot of talk in the last 10 years or so about the inequality of income of our society and lo lots of others. And that is not a um, uh, that's not a matter that a liberated person is concerned with. I don't care if Bill Gates is rich. That doesn't offend me. Uh, he didn't get rich by um, by stealing from, from people if he did. I would certainly not approve and want to have him in jail, but he didn't. Most of the enrichment of rich people in our economy is sending a signal that the activity that results in big uh, profits, we need to do more of. A, a surgeon makes more than a um, than than, a, than, than that makes more than a waiter, um, and what the economy is saying with that is it wants more of these surgeons. Now, in fact, the way things are organized, permissions are denied uh, for the last century or so. The medical profession. And, and, and nursing and so forth have created more and more obstacles to entering those those professions. So it, it's it's not equality of income or even equality of opportunity, which you'll often hear. Both of those are what is called in philosophy end state. Um, ethical 
convictions that we in our end state ought to be equal. And the trouble with this, aside from its uh, ne necessary coercions by the state in order to achieve this income equality, um, is that it uh, is that it it's impossible to attain, as Saint Saint Paul said. Uh, we all have our our graces. You speak Spanish, I speak English, um, uh, and I, I am an economist, so I can give you little stories about the economy and you're a waiter and you you can give me my food so we we have our skills and there's no way to achieve equality of outcome or even of opportunity by uh, uh, the coercions of, of the state Here's the uh, problem. I'm sure that most of the people who are hearing this talk are smarter than I am. I can assure you, I'm ignorant and uh, and, and, and 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 stupid on all kinds of things. So let's see. How are we going to achieve comprehensive equality? Income is not the whole point. If you're smarter than me. The only way we can achieve equality is to pound nails <laughs> into your head until you're as stupid as I am. If you can run faster than I can, and that, that would not be a great accomplishment, I assure you, then to achieve equality, we should put sandbags on your legs. Uh, if 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 you're a uh, more creative person than I am, suppose you're suppose you're Fred Astaire, and you're a great uh, uh, um, dancer. Well, then to make my clumsy dancing equal to Fred Astaire's, we've got to cut Fred's legs off practically. So you understand the point. Equality is not attainable. On the other hand, and here I'll start to come to an end, and we can have a we can have a, a, a discussion about these ideas. The um, what happens when you introduce liberalism in the classic sense to an economy? is that it inspirits ordinary people to extraordinary acts. It's a highly democratic outcome in the sense that everyone is being treated so far as permissions are concerned in, in the same way. If you're Edison and you want to invent the, uh, the, the tape recorder, you're allowed to. And, and the point is that since 1800, because of this new idea in the 18th century and the 1700s, that people should be equal in permissions, there's been an extraordinary increase in the, in the, um, in the technologies of all sorts in the economy. How much? Well, in understanding the importance of liberalism, it's very important to understand how large this inspiriting effect was. Uh, here, here's how large it is. In 1800, in modern prices, the average American, now this is in modern uh, uh, prices, earned, spent, created about $6 a day. Now imagine trying to live on $6 a day. It isn't hard to imagine it because there are still people in the world, although a radically falling percentage of the people in the world who are 
having this six dollars a day sort of lives, even two or three dollars a day. Now, the average American earns, spends, consumes, makes about $140 a day. That's the change from six to 140. And it's not because of, of capital accumulation and it's not because of exploitation. It's not because the savings rate increased, it didn't. And it's not because we in, enslaved black people in the United States. That's not what made us rich. What made us rich is ingenuity. And if you, I, I, I'll conclude here, if you, if you just look around your room, you'll be astonished at what you, what you see. We're on this uh, computer link, which was inconceivable 30 years ago. We have adequate food. We Americans spend a steadily declining percentage of our income on food. Uh, our housing is much better than it was when I was a small child, um, although I was not in a, a particularly poor family. I do vividly remember that you had to share your room with your with your with your brother and sister. So, so there's been this enormous increase. Um, medical knowledge alone, alas, they haven't devised a cure for stuttering. I wish they would. But I've got two artificial hips, which 30 or 40 years ago were extremely experimental and often didn't work. And now I'm able to walk. And before I was hobbling along on um, two um, canes. So we're much better off. And that's a result of a liberated society. Here's how I conclude. Even if liberalism had not resulted, in increased income, I would be in favor of it because it's an appropriate, dignified life of humans where they're not being treated as nationalist or socialist children. But in fact, it also made us rich. So we were with this, this extraordinary new idea of the breakdown of hierarchies resulted in this enormous increase in income. So I say, let's have more of that. <laughs> let's have free societies, charitable free societies, societies in which you treat people with equal dignity. So thank you very much. And I apologize again for my um, speech. I'm, I'm my, my speech defect. My problem is among all, I also stutter on the word stutter. So I, I often introduce talks by saying, look, I, I have a speech defect. For some reason, I don't stutter on that. So uh, and there you are. Um, uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, two percent of the born males and half of one percent of the born females have this uh, 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 problem. Well, thank you, Dr. McCloskey, for sharing your thoughts and your ideas. Really enjoyed listening. And I know that you are opened, uh, open to taking some questions. So we'll begin that the question and answers now. And I invite members of the audience to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We prefer you use the Q&A rather than the chat button. Um, and also, if you see a question that you really like, you can use the uh, thumbs up icon to vote for that question. That gives us an idea of, of what questions are popular. So I'm gonna turn this over now to Dean Brady. Dean Brady, will you facilitate the questions for us? 
My pleasure. Thank you very much, Dean Bryan. And Dr. McCluskey, thank you so much. Um, yes. What an excellent and engaging talk. And I see folks are already putting questions in here. Uh, I'm actually going to go for a definitional uh, question because a couple of folks have, have used the word libertarianism in yeah. their questions. And before we get to their questions, would you make a dis distinction between how you're sort of classically defining liberal and how most folks might use the term libertarianism or libertarian today? No, I would not. And I, the, the, the word libertarian was made over in the 1950s. Um, and it's a quite unnecessary word because we already have a word for this. The, um, and the, so I, I would, I'm on a personal campaign, I and a very few others, to get you all to stop calling yourself liberals if you're not, and to, and to admit that you're actually statists. <laughs> well, let me turn to Luke's question then. I'm curious to know your thoughts, he says, on libertarianism, lib libertarian or, or liberal paternalism. So yeah. to me, that sounds oxymoronic, but um, yes, yes, your is. thoughts on libertarian or liberal paternalism? It is. Um, my friend uh, at, at Cornell, Bob, I'm forgetting his last name, said this to me. He said, Deirdre, we nudgers, this is the, this is the terminology, we arrange things through the state so that you you foolish person will make correct decisions about your um, saving for your uh, retirement or whatever. And it is, it is a contradiction in terms. Either we're gonna treat people as adults or we're not. So I, I'm, although uh, um, Bob and all these people are amiable and nice people, they're, they're, they end up being authoritarians. They end up not treating other people as free adults. So um, I say, um, I say it's spinach and I say to hell with it. <laughs> well, let's invite uh, Dr. Vogt, uh, one of the Lewis lecturers in. Uh, Ryan, would you, Dr. Vogt, would you uh, have a question? Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks so much for this uh, talk. And uh, I, I'll, um, I'll just start by saying that um, to not embarrass myself, I went ahead and read this book before this. Um, and although I still claim to represent um, the kind of the, the many of us who, um, who are in some ways new to some of the things you're, you're um, challenging us with. Um, so hopefully I do justice to them. But my question, I have several questions. And um, First of all, and they tend to circle around this idea of like uh, human nature or what seems to be normal human behavior. Yeah. And uh, the question is, it seems very normal that we say in every capacity, okay, here was a mistake. Somebody kind of screwed up or somebody, let's try to prevent this from happening, right? So let's yeah. pass the law. Let's um, yeah. I don't know, make a new policy in the company so somebody doesn't do that again. Or let's, yeah. I don't know. Somebody doesn't know who uh, Napoleon is. Well, that needs to be part of the school exam. Like, make sure they know who yeah, Napoleon yeah. is. And it seems very human nature to just start adding, you know, whether it's laws or, you know, Correct. policies or whatever. That's the problem. Resist? That's that's a serious problem. As long as people are willing to be treated as children and to be um, bossed around by the state, then it's going to get larger and larger. Um, uh, Paul Krugman, for example, has never seen a regulation that he didn't like. Um, and uh, the, the, the American federal government has one million regulations. Now, I don't think we need one million regulations. There's a way we teach economics which is part of the problem here. We spend the first couple of weeks of the term showing students that supply and demand, you know, the 
the supply and demand cross is a good thing. And then we spend the rest of the term showing, exhibiting imperfections in that monopoly, uh, rent seeking, uh, consumer ignorance, blah, blah, blah. And the trouble is, as you point out, there are an infinite number of these if you don't need to actually prove them. And to the surprise of most people looking at economics, none of them have been shown to be large. You can draw a diagram on a blackboard that makes monopoly look very bad, but that's just a diagram on a blackboard. That very surprisingly, I have a, have, I have a paper on this, the actual empirical work that would show that these imperfections are so massive that we need to have nudging and, uh, uh, and, and people coming in and adding more regulations, uh, quite surprisingly, there's no evidence for it. In a similar vein to, to uh, the topic you were just on there, um, Daniel Biggs uh, says, I'm going to read it exactly as written. Adam Smith, bless his soul, decried the establishment of fixed costs on society like landlords charging rent. How can we more closely reach Adam Smith's vision without a state actor breaking down costs on behalf of a dispossessed population? Well, he, he, he Adam Smith was an egalitarian. He believed to, to an unusual degree for a man of his time in equality of, of permission. But he did not believe that landlords, for example, should be expropriated and their income handed over to the poor. Although in fact, he was in favor of, uh, of the village school, which characterized um, Scotland. The, uh, the, because the, the Scots were Calvinists, they could all read. Even, mm -hmm. e even women could read in Scotland. Whereas in England, south of the border, this was much less pre prevalent. So, he, so he, he, was, he was in favor of some things to um, equalize the, the, the starting point, but he was very fierce against what he called the men of, the men of system who believe that they, they know more about, I don't know, iron and steel production than the iron masters know. That they they find that he he has this marvelous image where he says the man of system believes that he can move the society as though he were moving chess men on a chessboard. And the more complicated the society becomes, and it's been greatly complicated since Smith's time, the more dangerous it is to have this. Uh, arrogance of the planner. I, you know, uh, the, the, there's an underlying problem here, which is it appears to be the case that people don't want to be free. So I'm devoted to telling them <laughs> that they want to be free because that's the life of a human of a dignified human, no longer a slave. Thank you. Um, this is frivolous after that sort of comment, but I feel the need to add that you, the Scottish did have a remarkable degree of literacy due to Calvinism uh, and Protestantism, but they also weren't allowed to eat potatoes for decades because they weren't mentioned in the Bible. So <laughs> I would take literacy over French fries, you know. Um, well, it's a close not thing, it's close. It is. It's a close Not, to, Freedom is clearly at the core of much of what you've talked about, and yeah. and the, it's a it's a term that's that's quite fraught in many ways. People understanding freedom in different ways, 
Um, yeah. the, uh, we have uh, a question from our founding director of the University of Kentucky Institute for the Study of Free Enterprise. John Guerin asks, you have emphasized in some of your recent work the importance of favorable cultural attitudes towards capitalism. Yes. And the success of capitalism and in, in, in enabling the great enrichment. And I yes. think were freedom in my mind in terms of people's freedom to do these things. And yeah. So he asked if you could comment on the current cultural environment in this regard. Is it new, different, or stronger from past objections to capitalism? What does it portend for the next few years and the following decades? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I'm I I have all these friends who are on the left or the right, um, uh, and I and I, I I respect them, and I, and they're my colleagues and friends, but they're wrong. They're uh, they want to treat people as children, and they become very both on the left and the right right become very indignant when you say well. It'll work out better if we leave people alone um, uh, to, to, to marry whom they want that gets the conservatives uh, um, crazy or to say what they want that gets the left wing of the Democratic Party crazy. Um, and I say, let's let people be. Now, understand, I, although I stutter on the word, I want us to use liberty because freedom has come to mean riches. So I believe it was the, 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 the third or the second of Franklin Roosevelt's speech in the early 1940s, freedom from fear, freedom from want. And that's to mix up Freedom in the sense of, you know, I'm free to fly. I'm free to, if, if I can, I actually can't, but if I could, I would be free to fly. And that would make me, um, that would make me, if I had this ability, I would be richer. Um, and that's to confuse income and wealth, for which we already have words, with this liberty of permission, which is the core of liberalism. Ken, Ken Trotsky asks to this point, this liberty, yeah. as a liberal, how to think then about abortion? Whose rights should be protected, the unborn or the mother? Well, uh, that <clears throat> if I had a snappy answer to that, I would be rich. <laughs> If there's some easy way of solving this dilemma, as a as a as a as a liberal, I'm very worried about state intervention in this. I don't mind if people, um, I don't know, um, stand outside abortion clinics and and shout it at people that's free, free speech but i draw the line at them bringing the state in the powers of the state I and mean, as it was famously said in 1919 by max weber the very definition of the state is a monopoly of violence of coercion and we certainly want that we don't want a bunch of uh, mafiosi r r running around co coercing people. We want a police force. And then as the uh, George Floyd trial is showing, we want to watch it. Um, but we've got to have, we've got to have the, the police. Um, so, so it's, um, it, it, <laughs> So again, you, you'll you, you'll see that I'm kind of evading the, the question here. I, I don't. If if uh, people say, ah, the life begins when the embryo has a heartbeat. Well, yeah, maybe you can make that case, but I, it's not God's will 
I mean, as I said, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and uh, I know what God wants, <laughs> and I want you to agree with me that God doesn't want us to be children. I just wrote an essay on free will and its analogies. This was for a um, theological journal. Um, the, the analogies between the profound freedom of the will that God, according to my account, gave us, that's freedom to sin. It's, it's meaningless if we're not able to do bad things. Uh, if we're if we're God's pets and we don't ever do anything bad, then then we're not free. Um, uh, and uh, I make a case that you don't have to be a socialist if you're a Christian. Excellent. I I look forward to reading that article. As you know, that's my my field and my area of research. Um, James uh, Ziliak, who I believe you know, has a Hi, question. Jim. <laughs> so Jim's got a question for you. Hi, Deirdre. Thanks for joining us at UK. For about the last 70 years, federal government spending as a share of GDP has hovered around 20%. The three yeah. largest buckets are national defense, social security, and health for low-income persons and seniors. That's In your right. view, is this too much? And if so, what role do you envision for social welfare in a modern liberal state? Well, it is too much. I always thank young people for paying for my care in hospitals and so on. I, when I, I had my hip replacement surgery, I didn't pay a dime. You did. So thank you very much. Uh, the, the state comes in and coerces you to transfer income to old people. Um, I, I, I think that's a clumsy way of uh, 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 doing it, I think it 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 creates waste. My my view of healthcare is that the best way to fix the American healthcare system is to give more permissions. Here's an easy one: we sh we Americans should be able to buy drugs in Canada. There's no good reason why Americans should pay five or six times what the Canadians pay for drugs. Yet, my elderly mother, who died a couple of months ago, uh, when she started to try to buy her drugs, her quite expensive drugs in Canada, the state came to her and threatened her. You know, we're going to put you in jail if you keep doing this. So I would, I would argue that what we've done with me medical care in the United States, and that's why it's so extremely expensive, is that we've um, honored monopolies one after another. The monopoly of the doctor's prescription power, for example. I was married for 30 years to a nurse. And in the period that I was married, nursing, to, to become an RN, you've got to go to college. Now, way back in the 1960s, you didn't need to go to college. You could get to be an RN through a hospital school of nursing. So in, in sort of case after case, the permissions have been closed off. Um, I, I, uh, I think, you know, as I said, I think Jim knows this perfectly well, that if you add up all the levels of government in the United States, it's about a third of income that go, that's, that's channeled through the state, whether it, the, the federal government or the state or the local, um, and in lots of other countries, it's even higher. So I, I say it's spinach and I say to hell with it. 
All right, uh, Ryan, I believe you've got a question for us. Yeah, so um, have you seen a couple of examples where uh, people have just started taking the ax to the layers and layers of rules, policies, whatever? Because I imagine, you know, I know I learned in physics that inertia is not a force, but, you know, the power of things to keep going in the same general direction. Yeah. Um, have you seen that? And also, um, do you, as kind of what you're saying that we in some ways need to have appropriate expectations that there will be things that are bad, painful, et cetera, but that in some ways we need to accept that as a reality and stop trying to legislate and policy our way out of experiencing these things in, in our world? Is that kind of what you're hinting there? Well, I, I'm not uh, saying that uh, if, if COVID-19 comes to a community that the state should do nothing at all. I have friends um, who do believe that fiercely and they think that the Swedish model is the correct way to handle this. I guess I don't, especially at the beginning. Uh, it's, it's wise, I think, to close down the economy for, for two weeks to see if we can get control of it. But unfortunately, the two weeks have extended to over a year. Um, so it's a very long two weeks. There, there's a blackboard conviction that economists have, as I said, that there are imperfections all over the place. Um, my friend Joe, Joe Stiglitz, for example, says, declares that there's research that shows that um, uh, that um, there are externalities in consumption that can't be solved in any other way than bringing in the state. And what Joe means by the research is some math that he's done on a blackboard. That's his idea of research. He's not an empirical scholar. And as an economic historian, which is kind of my uh, which is kind of my racket, um, I really insist that we measure it, that we know what we're talking about. Is monopoly a serious problem in the American economy? Is Google a monopoly? Now, there's a pronounced tendency, especially in the United States, to think that any large company is a monopoly. And I think it's kind of foolish. I, I think that it's, there's no evidence that Google has had a disastrous effect on, uh, on the welfare of the world. Um, no, I, I, so look, I can't do what I'd like to do, which is uh, take an ax to these 1 million federal regulations. Um, Milton Friedman, my, my colleague and friend a long time ago, had an exhibit. He had, he showed a step ladder, you know, about six feet tall. And beside it, he piled all the regulations about step ladders in the occupational uh, uh, um, uh, 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 health and, and, and safety. And the pile of regulations was taller than the step wire. That's, that's a, a, a lack of faith in the, um, in, the, um, in the ability of people to, to take care of themselves. And it ends up Killing economic growth, which is the main hope for, for, for the poor of the world. Several folks commented uh, as you talked about, you know, the um, Fred Astaire and putting sandbags or cutting off legs. Um, the, the, presumably the allusion to Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron. And yeah. um, one of our Lewis faculty members, Zeta Kamora, Dr. Kamora asks, um, and I'll try and summarize here, but referring to that and this sort of handicapping everyone to the lowest common denominator, 
But she says enterprises operating using a socialist model don't do that. If they're doing this equitably and in an economically sustainable manner, cooperatives, worker, self-directed enterprises run sustainably because they capitalize on the diverse abilities and positionalities of their worker owners. And she knows the Mondragon uh, Corporation in Spain is the most uh, obvious example. Yeah, so but, I mean, wondered, but, it's, but it's bankrupt. Okay. <laughs> so would you speak to this given your dismissal of socialism and strong Well, you know, I, I, I have lots of friends who, who believe that that the co-ops are the way forward. And I admire that because at least it's not the state coming in and, and, and forcing you to be good. It, it's, uh, and, but I think there's a tremendous optimism about co-ops. There was a cooperative movement of uh, retail trade in Britain in, in the 19th century, and there, there's the uh, there, there there's there's the Spanish case, and it, it there's nothing to prevent people from forming co-ops if they believe that's a good way to go. An accounting firm is a co-op. A law firm is a good co-op. Um, and fine, if you think that co-ops are the way to go, as long as you don't use the power of the state to force people into co-ops, I have no objection to it. And, and, and indeed, the, um, the underlying cooperation of a free society is massive. Uh, I give talks on economics, and that gives me the money to go buy some some groceries. Um, and and th this is extremely complicated and wonderful um, situation. I, as I said, I've just had my second shot. If we allocated bread the way we allocated the the COVID shots, we'd all be starving to death um, because it's a completely idiotic way of organizing this. Um, if, you, if you take advantage of people's, um, people's de desire to do well, it doesn't mean they have to be exploiting other people and being awful towards other people. On the contrary, innovism, the word I prefer strongly to capitalism, which is a very misleading word, Innovism is the most egalitarian system you can think of, because every person in, in, in business, ask them, wants to do better for his, 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 his customers. That's how he makes money, by doing a good job, whatever it is. Uh, Every year in the United States, well over 20,000 new products are introduced into grocery stores. I have a friend who's, who's in, in, in marketing and she tells me this, 20,000, most of them don't succeed, but it's, it's the uh, desire to do well that's being harnessed here. Stuart Carter uh, has a number of questions here, and this one I think follows on and as we're talking about um, about the economy and about the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, would you agree, he writes, that more decentralization of decision-making in the market and beyond is probably for the best, and then uses as an example the cryptocurrency and what folks are yeah. trying to do in that arena? So it could well, be two different questions there. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been asked a lot about this and I, I, I must say, I don't entirely understand blockchains, but I'm an economic historian and I've seen means of payment change over history. Every society has a means of payment. 
you you don't have to have coins or bank accounts in order to make a payment. Um, I'm a student of the uh, of of agriculture in the Middle Ages, and half of the population of England in the 13th century was hired labor. There was a rural proletariat, you might say, in the 13th century. It didn't wait until the until the 19th century. So I I um, I don't think that blockchains, whatever they are, are going to revolutionize our economy. People, non-economists especially, love to claim that some new means of payment or is the, the, the business we were just talking about, a new, organiz- a new co-op organization or a new central plan or this, that. Anyway, new stuff, they get very excited about it. But we economic historians are here to inform them that um, it's not the tricks of administration that have made us rich. It's allowing people to have a go, as the English say, one of my favorite phrases, to have a go and go they did. Liberalism made people willing to go to take a chance because they were they were given permission, and it's it's, it's not just the high um, research, it's not just um, Edison or some some scientist, it's the individual deciding to open a hairdressing salon in in the neighborhood. That we could call it low-level entrepreneurship is crucial to an economy. And I think you've used in other uh, lectures that I've I've uh, heard you in um, the example of of braiding in a neighborhood and so forth. And actually, yeah. following on from that, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that that really ask a very similar sort of um, um, uh, point of basically. What is the value of of this liberal view? What would the impact be on the poor? And then Nasmus um, has a, a particular focus on the equality of outcome. He liked that um, that you're talking about the impossibility of equality of outcome, but is asking about the equality of opportunity. Yes, but I I, I don't go for this phrase equality of opportunity because look. I'm the child of a professor at Harvard. My mother was an opera singer. (laughs) And I went to Harvard College and Harvard Graduate School and blah, blah, blah. So I had every advantage. Thank God I stuttered. Because if I didn't have this handicap, I would have been even more arrogant than I am now. (laughs) And that would be, you you wouldn't want to see that. That would be really ugly. So the... So I had all the advantages, um, but we, so it, it's the, the, the only way to achieve a situation where everyone has a Harvard p- professor as their father and an opera singer as their, uh, as their mother, the amount of intervention <laughs> that you'd have to engage in would be, would be massive. You'd have to treat people like children and you'd have to suppose that I know how you should live. And I I don't think that's wise. What we should be doing is giving people permission. You you mentioned the absurdity of not allowing people to braid hair for a living. They have to go to school and and learn to get a state license to braid hair. This is crazy. This is this is local. Um, this is not what we should do. In the in the state of Florida, uh, I think it changed recently. But to be an interior decorator, you needed a state license. So think of the disasters that would, would occur if you painted the wall the wrong color. I mean, my God, we've got to hit, bring the state in in its. In its 
and wisdom to keep the colors. Dusky rose must be kept to a minimum. That's right. Well, my, my big problem is uh, burnt orange. Oh. Which you, you're old enough to, to remember in the 1970s, burnt, there were burnt orange refrigerators. I'm surprised they didn't have cars in burnt orange, but it's a horrible. Uh, I had a shag carpet that was burnt orange in my bedroom. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. This is this. So, and I, I'm very much in favor of bringing in the coercive power of the state to stop burnt orange. Burnt orange. Fair. And you can, a reasonable use. And you can you 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 can see the absurdity of this. So I want to pivot a little bit. We have several questions here um, around university and academia. Uh, Ty yeah. Borders, who was a graduate student uh, when you were on the faculty at Iowa, sends his yeah. regards. Yeah. Uh, and then Allison Davis um, asks as well, related questions, the current state of liberalism in academia or uh, and what permissions have university students lost recently or at risk of losing? So from your perspective, what is the current state of academia with regard to well, what you're presenting? You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very old. So I remember when I was a kid, my father was an academic, as I mentioned, the, the McCarthy period in which the f freedom of speech in universities was under attack from the right, from the John Birch Society and so forth. Now it's under attack from, from, from the left. And I, you know, with this law, you know, the, the, the great advantage of being a historian is that you know there's no, nothing new under the sun. Um, and and I, 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 I'm not as panicked as uh, some of my friends. James, uh, Buchanan, the great Nobel Prize winning economist, was really disturbed by the 19s, by the 1960s. And uh, I, if Jim were alive, and actually when he was alive, I said this to him, Jim, don't worry, it'll swing back. Um, I, I think it's, it's disgraceful when University administrators um, cave into this. Um, uh, his, don't want to call it hysteria. This this deep, deep passion on the left that people shouldn't be allowed to say things. You know, I'm transgendered. In case people don't know that, till 1995, I was a man. My name was was Donald, and. Um, I don't insist that the university have rules that everyone should call me she. If someone wants to be nasty to me and call me he, oh, you can't really change gender. Who, who do you think you are, Donald? That's okay with me. It's, it's irritating. It's impolite. But I don't, sticks and stones can break my bones names can never hurt me. Now, when the names translate into violence, when you use the N-word about African-Americans, that tends to produce violence against American Blacks. And that's where I draw the line. I think it's very important that people understand that coercion is physical. It's not, the, I don't coerce you when I try to persuade you. You, 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 you may feel that way, but that's, that's, I think, kind of foolish. If, if I persuade you of the Pythagorean theorem, you're better off, presumably I am, because I was so eager to, um, and show it to you. There's a very elegant ancient Chinese proof of the Pythagorean theorem, for example. Um, what's the beef? A number of folks have asked about how you got into your career. Um, what led you into economics as opposed to other things? And, and in particular, 
Um, one person here, Luke, uh, is um, an economics major, but considering a graduate degree in English. So yeah. maybe speak a little bit about, you know, when you were an undergraduate and the transition and the direction that, uh, that you took academically and in terms of your research. Well, I, I started as, as a socialist. When I was 14 or, or, or 15, my hero was Prince Kropotkin a Russian prince who was an anarchist. Um, but he was a he was a socialist anarchist, which I regard as a as a as a contradiction in terms. And then I became a standard issue socialist. Now I was never very scholarly about it. Um, I but it when I grew up we, it was in the middle of the folk singing movement. So I know more labor and socialist songs than any of my friends on the left. We had a, uh, um, we made a, a union of the faculty at, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And to scare the administration, we, we were on the on the on the on the on the on the picket line, and I was teaching my left wing friends these songs. So I came at a liberal point of view via socialism. My purpose in becoming an economist was to help poor people. In a way, it always has been my purpose. I just think that what help most helps poor people is a is an is a liberal economy. But in the 1960s, when I was young, I was very much interested in running your life. We we had a phrase that we at the elite graduate schools in economics, uh, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, would, would be going down to Washington. And the phrase was to fine tune the economy. Now, this is nuts. But it was very flattering to these young people who were told that by just getting a PhD in economics, you could then run everyone's life. Um, but I finally I, I, I find it was slow. It took me a long time. I finally realized that this was not how economic history worked. It's not how a modern economy works. But I'm still interested in helping the poor. I just don't think that large bureaucracies employing college graduates to coerce the poor is the way to help them. So you've just shared about the fact that you were a socialist when you were younger and clearly for, for quite a while that yeah. um, you were um, a man or a transgender woman. Your understanding of both yourself and the world has clearly changed. You, you, You're you telling me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> suppose I am. What position that you currently hold are you now beginning to question? Well, that's, that's an interesting, well, for example, what I thought I held was the idea that, um, 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 that, to, that, that to fight a plague, the, the government should be involved. Hmm. And my friends, my, my fiercely liberal friends don't think so. And so I'm, I'm full of doubt about this. I expressed my doubt about um, the ethics of uh, uh, the ethics of uh, abortion. Mm -hmm. I have lots of uncertainties. Um, but what I don't have an uncertainty about is that free people are more creative. And in the end, they're happier. I mean, it would be nice to be a child for your whole life. And mommy and daddy would take care of you. 
but it's not a dignified position. Well, I just want to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mikulski, so very, very much uh, and, and thank our, our attendees and the questioners. And with that, I'm gonna return it to uh, uh, Dean Bryan. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Brady, for uh, facilitating the questions and Dr. Vote and everyone who's asked your questions. And I think this is one of the first webinars where I've been to where we have more questions than we have time to answer them. And Dr. McCloskey, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insights and ideas. And especially when you're not feeling well, um, you, you were remarkable. So thank you. Yeah. Um, and I really appreciate that you're a speaker. We're, we're privileged that you're a speaker of our Lewis Speaker Series here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, before I conclude, do you have any last remarks or anything have, you'd like to say? I have one last remark. I'd like to come to Kentucky. I have I have a, a couple of old friends, John Lyon and John and then Nelson. John Nelson was a was a graduate of the University of K K Kentucky and now teaches at Iowa. And these were dear friends. And on the basis of a sample size of two. I concluded that people in Kentucky are really nice. So I want to come there and, and you know, I'm a social scientist. I want to know if that's true. I, I think it is on the whole. And so I, please in, well, hide me sometime and I'll come and try to persuade Kentuckians to be even nicer. I think between the College of Arts and Sciences, the Lewis Honors College, and the Gatton College of Business and Economics, we can probably find a way. Well, you know, I have, in fact, you said that I have six honorary degrees. I actually have 11, and uh, I'm very anxious to get honorary degrees. Um, Marcia Sen, a famous economist and, uh, who I'm acquainted with, has 90 honorary degrees, nine zero. Now, I'm not ever going to catch up with that, but I love honorary degrees. So give me a Lord High, uh, give me a rank. I've, I've always wanted to be Dame Deirdre, but, but the Constitution forbids Americans to accept patents of nobility. So I'm thinking of changing my name to Dame Deirdre. <laughs> there you go. We hear you. But in the meantime, we're going to send you some Kentucky. So look for a package from us with some uh, some Kentucky goodies, so you can oh, enjoy. Wonderful. So you can enjoy some of Kentucky uh, before you have a chance to come here. But we will Doesn't, certainly follow up with that. Are, are you going to send me a horse? Well, no, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> Maybe some nice photos of horses. <laughs> that would be nice. That would okay. Be nice. But, but when you come here, we'll make sure you uh, see some horses. Now, right, now <laughs> the, right now, the pastures are full of baby horses. So it's, yeah. it's, yeah, so it's a delight to drive around in the bluegrass uh, in the spring. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, thank you again. And I want to okay, thank you. Thank everyone for joining us this evening. A recording of this talk is available on our YouTube channel, and we'll also share the links on Facebook and Twitter.